Okay, so the topic of this video are organic molecules. Now, here's a table of the four categories of organic molecules, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. I'm just going to introduce organic molecules today and then discuss carbohydrates. I have another video for proteins, another for lipids, and another for nucleic acids. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, organic molecules are are molecules that are built around carbon, maybe one atom of carbon, maybe multiple atoms of carbon. And so here we have a periodic table square of carbon. And there's something that's fairly unique about carbon, and I'll show you that in just a moment. But first of all, carbon has six protons, if you recall from our periodic table, which means it also has six electrons. So why don't I draw the six electrons of carbon? Remember, I can only draw two electrons in the first level, but then I can put the remaining four electrons in the second level. Well, now we see why carbon is unstable. Remember, the second level of electrons needs a total of eight, but you can see in the picture, Carbon only has four electrons in the second level. So carbon is unstable. And because carbon is unstable, it's going to bond probably up to four different times. And that's what makes carbon unique. Most atoms do not bond uh, four times, but carbon does. And because carbon bonds, every single carbon atom bonds uh, four times, it's going to Carbon will often be the center of some very complex molecules, which I'll show you in a little bit. So when we go on into organic molecules, I want to mention that uh, molecules can be big and small. And so a small carbon molecule, it, it, just a general word for a small carbon molecule, is what we call a monomer. Now, there are various kinds of monomers. For example, you may have heard of amino acids. Amino acids are a small organic molecule. They're a monomer. But when you link one monomer with another, with another, with another into a big chain, you get what's called a polymer. So polymers are large complex chains of monomers. So in my example here, we can see that a protein is an example of a monomer, and it's made from a large collection of smaller amino acids. So just as I said a moment ago, a whole bunch of chained amino acids makes up a larger protein. The amino acids individually are the monomers. The overall protein is the polymer. Here's another example. A bunch of simple sugars, a whole bunch of simple sugars are monomers, and when they're linked together, they make up a larger structure called a complex sugar. Now, this is going to be more of what we talk about later in the video, because simple sugars and complex sugars are carbohydrates, and eventually I'm going to get into carbohydrates. Uh, there's another type of, of organic molecule. First of all, you see a whole bunch of nucleotides. When they bond together, they make something called a nucleic acid. So nucleic acids are a polymer, and they're made up of a bunch of monomers called nucleotides. So DNA and RNA are nucleic acids that are made from nucleotides. So when we look at carbon, there's carbon, and each dot represents the four dots, the four electrons that carbon has in its second energy level. I didn't draw the first energy level for, for simplicity, so I'm only focusing on the second energy level of carbon. So if I were to ask you, is carbon stable with only four electrons in its outer layer? I hope you know the answer is no. Well, here's four atoms of hydrogen. Hydrogen only has one total electron. That's it. One total electron. There's four of them, four hydrogen atoms. So look at these four hydrogen atoms. Are any of them stable? They only have one electron in its first level. I hope you know that the first level is supposed to hold two. So hydrogens are not stable either. So when you look at all five of the atoms, the four hydrogens and the one carbon, all of these atoms are unstable. So what do atoms do when they're unstable? Look at this. When atoms are unstable, they bond. They bond and make molecules. This is a molecule by the name of methane, CH4. One carbon, four hydrogens. They share electrons. This would be an example of a covalent bond.
And notice when they do, each individual atom is stable. I highlighted the hydrogen on the left. It's stable because it's got two electrons in the first level. The bottom hydrogen, also stable, because it, it has two electrons and it, it only has one energy level, and energy level one can is full and stable with two electrons. The hydrogen on the right, same thing. It has two electrons, its own and then a borrowed one from carbon, stable. The hydrogen on top, also stable because it has two electrons and two is all that's required to make the first level stable. Well, look at the carbon in the middle. The carbon in the middle has eight electrons. That too makes carbon stable because remember eight is the desired number to make the second level stable. So when they bond, all the atoms become stable. But there, you know, there's a problem when you draw these dot diagrams. These are called Lewis dot diagrams, by the way. When you draw them, they can be a little time consuming. So try this instead, watch this. Instead of dots, simply add dashes. Notice that each dash represents two electrons. So the, uh, we're going to be drawing these more throughout the course of, of the, this video and then my school. So here's, a, again, what I mean by the dot diagrams can be a little complex. And, and so uh, this dot diagram with carbon in the middle and four fluorines around the outside is the same thing as this right here. This, uh, this dashed diagram, much more simpler. And so again, just to remind you that one dash equals two electrons. And so I mentioned earlier, because carbon can bond up to four times, it's going to often be involved in some very complex molecules. Well, here's a very simple example. You saw this a moment ago of methane. You know, if we uh, look at all the single dashes, these are examples of single bonds. And if we focus on the carbon in the middle, focus on the carbon in the middle, you can see that there's four dashes attached to the carbon in the middle. Remember, one dash is two electrons, so four dashes is eight electrons. This carbon is stable. If we look at a more complex example, isooctane, here's a more complex example. If we pick a carbon from there, any carbon, that carbon right there, how many electrons does that carbon have? Notice there are four dashes coming off of that carbon for a total of eight electrons. It's stable, as are all the other carbons. I just chose that one right there. Sometimes you can have double dashes, and these are what are called double bonds. It looks like an equal sign. And again, if you, that just means that they share multiple electrons. And if we pick a carbon, any carbon, how about that carbon right there on the right? How many dashes are attached to that carbon? You see four dashes. Remember, one dash is two electrons, so four dashes is eight electrons. That carbon's stable, as are all the other carbons, because they also have four dashes each. Well, can there be a triple bond? Yes, here's an example of a triple bond. You can see that uh, there's a triple bond holding those two carbons together. If I ask you to focus your attention on the carbon to the left, how many electrons does the carbon on the left have? You see four dashes attached to the carbon on the left. That's a total of eight electrons. That carbon is stable. Carbon can also form these ring structures. You see a variety of single bonds and double bonds in this diagram. And if you pick any carbon, pick that carbon right there, you can see that that carbon has four dashes attached to it for a total of eight electrons. Pick any carbon, you'll notice they all have four dashes for a total of eight electrons. Okay, so that was a quick introduction of carbon and organic molecules, but now I want to specifically focus on a type of organic molecules known as carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are readily available in, in, in the foods that we eat. Pastas and fruits, for example, are high in carbohydrates. Now, when you look at the chemical structure of a carbohydrates, you generally are going to see a pattern. Carbohydrates are made from carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And usually you're going to see a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. For every one carbon, you'll find two hydrogens. For every one carbon, you'll find one oxygen. A great example is in the picture, C6H12O6. That's the formula for glucose. And if you look, there's six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. So there's double the amount of hydrogens 
compared to carbon and oxygen. Well, here's another example. This is the example of the molecule called fructose. Notice it too has a a uh, formula of C6H12O6. So glucose and fructose have the exact same formulas, but the, the atoms are just arranged in a different configuration. By the way, these are molecules called isomers when they have the exact same uh, chemical equation, chemical formula, but just arranged in a different combination. But notice glucose and fructose, they each have a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, I mentioned earlier that simple sugars can form larger complex sugar. Well, the scientific name for a simple sugar is called a monosaccharide. So a monosaccharide is a simple sugar. They're the same thing. And when one monosaccharide bonds with another, with another, with another, with another, with another, we get a larger object called a polysaccharide. So a complex sugar is the same thing as a polysaccharide. Polysaccharide is just more of the scientific term for a complex sugar. So complex sugars are made from smaller, simple sugars. And so how do these monosaccharides, how do these simple sugars bond together? Well, I want to introduce you to a process called dehydration synthesis. And you think of what it means to be dehydrated. If something's dehydrated, it means that it's lacking or it's lost water. Now watch what happens between monosaccharide 1 and monosaccharide 2. Watch this. In between monosaccharide 1 and 2, water is removed. The removal of water bonds the monosaccharide 1 and monosaccharide 2 together. They're now sharing one of the oxygens. The same thing happens between monosaccharide 2 and 3. Watch this. A dehydration synthesis reaction is going to occur. The removal of water will bond monosaccharide 3 to monosaccharide 2. And so now we have this larger molecule. This is all one molecule in my diagram. It's just made from three smaller monosaccharides. So I want to bring up and go into a little more detail with uh, the dehydration synthesis reaction. So in dehydration synthesis, as I just mentioned, water, a molecule of water is going to be removed. Here we have two in this picture, two monosaccharides, and notice how the OHs have been highlighted in red. Well, when we look at the, uh, the next part of this chemical reaction, we're going to show you how these two monosaccharides bond together. So dehydration synthesis is the process where larger molecules are built from smaller molecules. If we look at, again, this diagram, monomer number one plus monomer number two, through the removal of water, through the removal of water, they are going to bond to make a polysaccharide. Actually, this would just be what's called a disaccharide because there's two of them bonded together. But if there's more than two, we'd call it a polysaccharide. So, th so this is, again, how large molecules are built. What about the opposite? The opposite of a dehydration synthesis reaction is a hydrolysis reaction. And this is where large molecules are broken down into small molecules. It's called hydrolysis, hydro, because water is going to be added. Lysis simply means to break apart. So water is going to help break apart a larger molecule. So this is going to cause larger polymers to break into small monomers. And in the diagram, we see a polysaccharide. Actually, this would again be a disaccharide on the left because there's two monomers that make this together. But when we look at the equation plus H2O, right in the middle of the equation with the addition of water, that's going uh, to that's gonna break that polysaccharide into monomer number one and monomer number two. So a larger molecule gets broken down into two smaller ones. I have a nice animation of this in just a moment. So this is the way that all organic molecules are either built, they're either built by dehydration synthesis, or broken down or reduced. They're reduced and broken down by hydrolysis. So here's the, the animation that I, th I, mo I said a moment ago that I think will help visualize this. At the top, dehydration synthesis. With the removal of water, with the removal of water, 
those three monosaccharides have been bonded together to make a larger polysaccharide. Well, now look at the bottom of the animation for hydrolysis. With the addition of water, that large polysaccharides now been broken down into three individual monosaccharides. So they are really just the opposites of one another. Okay, so I mentioned that carbohydrate polymers go by the name of polysaccharides. So we remind ourselves that a polysaccharide is a long chain of monosaccharides. Well, there's three polysaccharides that I want to give special attention to just because they're quite important in the world of biology. The first is a polysaccharide by the name of starch. And starch is a plant sugar, so you only find it in plants. You don't find starch in animal meat or fish or eggs or anything. So it's a sugar, it's a complex sugar, a polysaccharide, that is, uh, that is converted and stored by plants. And so I'll touch on that in just a moment, but if we look at the picture here, starch, very simplistically in this diagram, is made from five monomers of glucose. If we look at its actual chemical diagram there, you can see it's, it's made from five monomers. Five uh, glucose sugars make up starch. Foods that are high in starch would be potatoes, would be breads, and rice. So again, potatoes will store their sugar in the form of starch. So the next polysaccharide I want to mention is called glycogen. You know, here's a picture, a, fa a fairly detailed picture of glycogen, and it's animals' version of starch. So you don't find glycogen in plants, you only find it in animals. And we store this for, for energy. We often store it in our body, stores it in our liver and in our muscles. You know, this is a fairly detailed diagram, but there's actually 30,000 glucose monomers that make up glycogen, so it is a fairly large molecule. And I mentioned a moment ago that it's often stored in the liver and it's stored in the muscles. And whenever, our, whenever we're low on blood sugar, so if we've been exercising or working really hard and we're low on blood sugar, our liver and muscles will release this stored glycogen into our blood to raise our sugar level back up. And the last one I want to mention is called cellulose. Now here's a diagram of a plant cell. You might remember from earlier that plants have, an, have a cell membrane. You can see it's labeled yellow, also called the plasma membrane, but plants have an outer boundary to them as well called the cell wall. The cell wall is made from cellulose, a very tough, very fibrous molecule. And so foods that are high in cellulose would be celery. If you just know from your experience with biting and chewing celery, it's a very hard to, hard to chew, hard to digest, and very fibrous, tough plant because it's full of cellulose. So cellulose is a very important component in the cells, the cell wall of plants. So if you're in my honors biology class, I am going to give you your free response, your essay question for the chapter two test. And here it is. Now, the only thing you're not gonna know is what version you're gonna get. Half of you will randomly get version A, and I'm gonna ask you to diagram the process of hydrolysis. Half of you will get version B. I'm gonna ask you to diagram the process of dehydration synthesis. Now, keep in mind, they're really just opposites of one another. So uh, we'll talk more about this in class, but you can always pause the video and, uh, and try to solve this at home in the days leading up to, leading up to the test. And we'll talk more about this in class. So if you're watching the video, pause this and try to answer these questions. If you're in my biology class, pause the video and you know write your answers on a separate sheet of paper. I'd be happy to check them before school or after school for accuracy. So go ahead and pause the video. Good luck.